Imagine you're new to a city, not yet having a vehicle and having to rely on public transit. On your first day of commuting, you did not have change, so your bus driver denied you from boarding. You then questioned your life decision whether it was right when you took the move. Well, yes, your decision is still right. It's just the inconvenience of how you have to pay for your bus fare discouraged you from using transit and, unfortunately, probably for a long time. It's now 2024, and if your transit agency is still insisting you on paying for your fare by cash, coins are changed, or having very little options for refilling your transit card, make sure you let them know that you cannot accept this. Paying for your bus or rail pass is one of the most minor and shortest spans of your trip, so many people ignore this process, but it does play a crucial role in welcoming riders aboard. Coins are hard to acquire. You have to buy something, pay it with cash, in order to gather them. Meanwhile, not having a machine that can help you refill your card or view your balance can also be a problem if you don't have enough balance in your card and realizing that too late. It also sucks to have to reach designated areas to refill the cards instead of doing it online where you can just register your card with an account and add balance to it. All of these processes are complicated enough for existing riders already, let alone new users who are not familiar with the system. And it's just the regular psychology of humans we tend to avoid complicated or difficult things. So indeed, a complicated and inconvenient ticketing system is enough to dissuade people from hopping on public transit. But wait, there are people who have no other choices but to use public transit. Some of the people in this group are also low-income individuals who qualify for discounted pass, low-income subsidies, or even free passes. That sounds great for equity and accessibility, right? until you realize that the process of applying for such programs can be such a hassle due to the limitations in services. You often have to come to the main customer service centers, wait in line, submit your documents, wait for them to be approved before they will ask you to pick your discounted pass a few days later if you don't want to spend some buck in having it delivered to you. Other agencies have options for online registration, but navigating it is also a challenge. Not to mention some people may not have access to a device or don't even know how to use a device to get to the service that they need. What is more problematic of a loophole is the process to get the accessibility pass that some cities offer for people with physical disabilities. However, to be qualified, they also have to go through the same painful and long process with a lot of moving around, which ironically is not accessible at all. Having more than one main customer service center or kiosk scattered across a city can improve the accessibility for not just the people in need of such subsidies, but also for anyone who wishes to refill their pass or buy some transit passes for them when they need to, especially consider how far one could be if they live in a sprawling city. If agencies choose to go with the online application route, they have to ensure that such information is available to riders in many ways. We're living in a society with lots of innovation in information delivery, so there are numerous ways to let riders know about this. Social media, website information, banners and advertising, all of which contributes to spreading the messages to riders. That is what accessibility and equity would truly look like when people in need have an appropriate and easy way to access the services that are dedicated for them and have the rights to get to know about them. Can we go back to talk about ticketing for other groups of riders? Yeah, for sure. There are many ways to help people familiarize themselves with how to pay for their bus fares, as well as how to make it more comfortable, convenient, and effortless for them. Mobile ticketing is the first example where passengers can buy passes from an app and the ticket will display as a QR code when they're boarding the bus. There is also a scanner allowing riders to scan this code to create a touch-free environment for ticketing. Sometimes, an integrated app can even allow you to look up the schedule, view real-time information, and buy tickets at the same time. If the agency decided to implement both mobile ticketing and transit cards, they have to make sure that there are accessible locations for ticket purchases at both options. Better yet, a linkage between a physical card and the online balance will help create a smooth way to pay, in both case if a person's phone dies when they need to take transit or their card's not available that day. Some systems in the world have even gone above and beyond with this when allowing you to use this physical or virtual card for purchases outside of transit payment, such as vending machines or convenience stores, which is amazing. The next step in making transit payment more convenient is the inclusion of Interact debit and credit cards for payment. This option is basically the same as the one for all card I just mentioned, but it uses your bank card. 
This way, riders don't even have to buy a card or online tickets. Just show up to the bus and tap their credit cards and now they're ready to go. We still have a long way to go from here, but Interact Debit and Credit Purchases has been available at ticket machines and fare gates. This also helps reduce the number of cards a rider has to carry, but the onboard machines also have to recognize the user's cards just so that it doesn't accidentally charge them during their transfer period. And finally, we cannot talk about the convenient ticketing system without mentioning fare capping. If you don't know what that is, then it's basically a ceiling fare amount that an agency can charge you for your ride before you can ride for free. Instead of making you pay for a fixed amount up front for an extended period of time. To put it more simple this way, let's say your monthly pass is $70 and a single ride pass is $3.50. If you pay this $70 up front, that is a lot of money to spend. But fare capping eliminate that payment by only charge you that $3.50 for an individual trip until your 20th ride. Any ride after that will be free for you for the rest of the month. If you ride transit a lot, then this fare capping can happen within one week. That means you already reach the monthly cap in just a week, and no big payments have to be paid up front. This fare capping system can even work on a regional scale if a region has multiple fare zones. This system also saves money for riders, and I personally would say that it saves you better than a monthly or day pass. You can try this for yourself by dividing the cost of your monthly pass or daily pass over how many times you use transit on that day or month, and then compare it to the fare capping rate. Let's go back to the example of the single ride and monthly pass above. Fare capping can help you save money if you're not riding up to the $70 monthly pass limit, but you're riding more often than one or two rides per week. We all know that your first 20 rides will be charged, so let's say that you ride anywhere between 10 or 20 rides per month. You're paying less than the monthly rate, yet still have enough balance to ride for all your needs. Another example of how fare capping is saving you money is the day pass. Let's say it's $10 for a full 24 hours, but if you only ride twice or three times a day, then it's not much cheaper than paying for single rides with fare capping. From an article on Ballard, Riders do not want to wait in the slow, crowded ticket lines, and touchless ticketing is critical especially following the pandemic. Truly, using cash as a payment not only poses riders at exposures to germs and other unhealthy particles from coins, but also increases the contacts they have to make to acquire these cash. C40 cities also outline integrated fares and operations as important features, saying that smart ticketing system can make passengers only have to pay once for trips that include multiple transit modes while also saving passengers money by just charging their specific journey and travel frequency. This argument is further backed by Amasabi's research on key factors influencing ridership in North America. 30% of the participants answer that they would primarily use public transit if it's the most convenient options, while 13% said the availability of mobile ticketing will persuade them to ride transit more often. Another 13% answered the introduction to mobile ticketing made them ride the transit systems in their communities easier. A research on Science Direct took place in the city of Tallahassee, Florida, also pointed out an upward change in ridership after mobile ticketing is introduced by the city. 41% of the respondents said they made more bus trips after using the mobile tickets, while 75% were positive that they spent less time trying to purchase a pass. Easy to use, less cash, and saving time were the three main user benefits that the 80 respondents pointed out. Better ticketing and payment system also helps speeding up the boarding process, which can help improve transit reliability. Overall, having a decent, convenient, and flexible ticketing system is one step closer to make transit more appealingly welcoming. There are many other factors that can alter the behaviors of riders while riding public transit, like frequencies, comfort, convenience, weather, safety, and more. But having an improved ticketing system can reduce the confusion and frustrations of having to find a convenient store to buy a pass or acquire coins, save more time while boarding, and introduce a modern way to ride transit in the future. It can be expensive for agencies to install such systems, but it's a good opportunity cost that creates huge positive externalities and can bring about large induced implicit and explicit revenues. I'd like to thank all my supporters who support me via my Buy Me A Coffee page. If you'd like to see your names at the end of the video, check out the donation links in the bio. I appreciate any amount that you chip in as making these videos require a lot of efforts, research, and also money for articles and books. But you helped maintain my motivation. See you in the next videos.